Let's finish up this introductory series on special relativity by talking about the relativistic Doppler effect. But if we want to derive the relativistic Doppler effect, we need to start off by defining what a wave vector is. If you studied basic wave physics, then you know that a wave function psi, which is basically the disturbance in the wave that results in the peaks and the troughs, can be written for a sinusoidal wave as an amplitude a times the sine of k dot r minus omega t plus an angle phi. Let me go over what each of these terms means. The psi represents the wave function, which describes the disturbance of the wave as a function of position in space given by the position vector r and the time t. So for instance, for a water wave, the psi would be the vertical displacement of the water above or below the regular water level. For a sound wave, the psi would describe the air pressure at different locations and at different times, etc. A represents the amplitude of the wave disturbance. Omega represents the angular frequency, so 2 pi times the regular frequency f. Phi is the phase shift, and the r vector represents the position vector at which we're evaluating the wave disturbance, the psi. And finally, the t represents the time. The vector k here that's being dotted with the r is called the wave vector. The wave vector tells you the direction in which the individual waves in the function psi are traveling. It has three elements, one in the x direction, one in the y direction, and one in the z direction. Note that the superscripts represent an index and not a power here. So for example, if my wave were only propagating in the x direction, my wave vector would only have the k super x component. The other components would be zero. So if I dot that with my position vector r given by x, y, and z, I just get k super x times x. And if we plug this into our wave function equation, we get the familiar function representing a wave traveling or propagating in the x direction. You could still have the disturbance if you deviate from the x-axis and go up or down the y or z axes, but the wave disturbance would only be traveling and would only depend on the x direction. Now the magnitude of my three-dimensional wave vector, which I can write as a simple k without the arrow, is 2 pi over lambda, where lambda is the wavelength of my wave. It's the distance between two points on the wave disturbance that are at the same phase, so the distance between two peaks or the distance between two troughs, for example. In the standard three-dimensional space we're all used to, the magnitude of a vector is the square root of the sum of squares of all its components, which means that in terms of its three components, the magnitude of the wave vector k is the following. The other important thing to derive from this discussion on basic wave physics is the wave speed, which I'll denote by v sub psi, psi representing the wave. The speed of a wave is how much distance it goes forward per unit time. In other words, if the wave travels forward by its wavelength lambda over a time period capital T, then the speed of the wave is lambda over T. In terms of its frequency, the wave speed is lambda times f, and if we rewrite things in terms of the angular frequency, then the wave speed is just lambda times omega over 2 pi. But we know from our discussion just now that 2 pi over lambda is just the magnitude of the wave vector k, so if we plug that in, then we find that the wave speed is omega over the wave vector magnitude k. I'll call this equation 1 because it'll come in handy later on when we start deriving the relativistic Doppler effect. So now that we've discussed some basic wave physics, let's move to the world of special relativity. Just like how there's a wave vector in three-dimensional classical physics, there's a similar wave 4 vector in special relativity which I'll denote by capital K. The components of capital K include K super T and the spatial components for X, Y, and Z. Now these three spatial components describe the wave 3 vector, so think of this as the relativistic version of the wave 3 vector, which again I'll denote by small k with the arrow. The problem now though is that we don't have an expression for the k super t component, but worry not because we can find that expression by using some quantum physics. This isn't a formal derivation by the way, it's more of a motivation if anything. Also, I don't really fully expect you to know quantum physics, but in quantum physics there's this fundamental idea that the energy of a photon is related to its angular frequency omega by the following relationship, where h bar is the reduced Planck's constant, so h over 2 pi. Now based on equation 1, if the wave I'm considering is light, then the speed of light is related to its angular frequency by the following. This means that omega can be written as k times c. If we then plug this into our energy frequency equation, then we find that the energy of this photon can be written as h bar times its speed c times its wave vector magnitude k. If I isolate k, then I'll get e over h bar times c, and I'll call this equation 2.
We know from my previous video that the ratio of energy to the speed of light comprises the time component of my momentum 4 vector, the p super t. So just like how p super t was e over c for the time component of momentum, we can also express the time component of our wave vector as e over h bar times c. Again, the energy E is just h bar times omega, so if we plug that back into equation 2, we find that our k super t can be written as the angular frequency of the wave divided by the wave speed c. So in the end, our wave 4 vector k can be written as the following. For now, you'll have to believe me when I say that this is a 4 vector, even though I won't rigorously show it here. So now that we've got our wave 4 vector, let's derive our relativistic Doppler effect. Suppose I have an electromagnetic wave, so it could be visible light, a microwave, radio, whatever, and that this electromagnetic wave is a wave propagating in two-dimensional space. So its wave vector has a zero z component, but non-zero t, x, and y components. Suppose that this wave is emitted from a source, and that there is an observer who sits in the inertial reference frame of the source, which I'll call R. I've drawn R with three axes here because of the two spatial dimensions and the one time dimension that we're considering. Now because this observer in R sits in the reference frame of the source, he is stationary with respect to the source. The source I've drawn is located at the origin of my reference frame. Suppose also that according to the observer in the source's reference frame, the wave is emitted with an angular frequency omega naught, and that it's emitted at an angle of theta naught with respect to the x-axis. I've labeled theta naught here as well. Finally, suppose that the magnitude of the three-dimensional part of the wave vector, the wave 3 vector, so the small k arrow, suppose that the magnitude of the small k arrow for this wave is just given by small k. This means that in the source's reference frame, in the unprimed reference frame, the time component of the wave vector for this electromagnetic wave is just omega naught over c. The x component of the wave vector is just k times cosine theta naught. This gives the x component of the wave's propagation. Remember, the wave 3 vector, as we discussed at the start of the video, tells us about the direction of the wave's propagation. So the x component represents the degree to which the wave propagates in the x direction. Meanwhile, by a similar logic, the y component of the wave vector is k times sine theta naught. The z component is zero, as we've already mentioned. Suppose now that I have a different reference frame r prime, and that this reference frame is traveling at a velocity v in the x direction relative to the reference frame r. Suppose that these reference frames line up their x, y, and z axes at t equals t prime equals zero, and then they start their clocks. In that case, let's say that an observer in the reference frame r prime will observe a wave vector k prime for the electromagnetic wave. We can write this r prime wave for vector k prime with the components omega over c, k cosine theta, k sine theta, and some z component which will turn out to be zero. Of course, there's no reason for someone in r prime to observe that the wave is going in the z direction when it wasn't even originally emitted in that direction, so intuitively it should make sense that the z component is still going to be zero. But do bear in mind that in general we can't assume that someone in the reference frame r prime will measure the same angular frequency, the same magnitude k, or even the same angle of emission theta. That's why instead of labeling these with a zero subscript, I'm labeling them differently because as you'll see, these quantities become different in the new reference frame. Now because capital K is a 4 vector, the relationship between capital K and capital K prime can be found using this Lorentz transformation equation, where lambda is the Lorentz transformation matrix. If we replace all of these quantities by their corresponding vectors and matrix forms, we get this matrix equation. Note that gamma sub v is given by 1 over the square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared. If we perform the full matrix multiplication, this is what we end up with for the right-hand side of our matrix equation. If we now equate the individual components, we get the following set of four equations. I'll call these set of equations 3. We'll simplify the first equation by multiplying both sides by c and taking the gamma and omega naught common from the right-hand side. When we do that, we get the following. We know that from equation 1, the wave speed is just the ratio of the angular frequency to the corresponding k, and since we're dealing with light, this ratio of omega naught to k naught is just the speed of light c. If we then divide both sides by omega naught, then this means that our equation for the ratio of the angular frequency measured in the reference frame r prime to the angular frequency omega naught in the reference frame of the source is the following.
Let's write out our gamma to get the following. We can then try to get rid of the c squared term in the denominator with the v squared by multiplying the numerator and denominator with c. When we do that, this is what we end up with. Let's analyze this equation a bit. Suppose that my wave is traveling directly along the x-axis in my source's reference frame, meaning that theta naught is zero. The cosine of zero is one, so the ratio of omega to omega naught is the following. Since c squared minus v squared is c minus v times c plus v, this expression further simplifies to omega over omega naught equaling the square root of c minus v over c plus v. So this means if my receiver, my observer in the reference frame r prime is traveling in the same direction as the electromagnetic wave, meaning that the receiver is running away from the wave, then the frequency my receiver perceives is less than the original frequency emitted from the source's reference frame. The frequency is red shifted or shifted to a lower frequency because red has a lower frequency than blue, for instance. On the other hand, if my receiver is traveling in the opposite direction as the electromagnetic wave, then we can say that our wave is traveling in the negative x direction while the receiver is traveling in the positive x direction. In that case, theta naught would be pi or 180 degrees, and you can show that the ratio of angular frequencies becomes flipped. In this case, the wave's frequency is blue shifted or shifted to a higher frequency in the R prime reference frame. These two formulas, by the way, cover the longitudinal Doppler effect for light, which happens when the receiver is traveling along the same line as the wave. If I now go back up to equations 3, then if we take the ratio of the second equation to the first equation, this is what we get. Once again, the ratio omega over k and omega naught over k naught are both the speed of light, the speed of the wave we're considering. This means the expression on the left just becomes cosine theta. Meanwhile, since gamma is common to every term, we can also cancel that out to get a more simplified right-hand side. If we then plug in omega naught in terms of c and k naught, and then cancel out the k naughts that result as well as the c's, this is what we get for cosine theta, the cosine of the angle that the receiver perceives the wave of light traveling in his own r prime reference frame. You can see that this angle is not necessarily the same as the angle the wave was emitted at in the source's reference frame, unless the r prime reference frame was stationary with respect to r, so if v were zero. The effect that results when the emission angle of the wave in the source's reference frame differs from the angle perceived in a receiver's reference frame that is in relative motion with respect to the source, this effect is called aberration. So what we've done here is that in addition to the relativistic Doppler effect, we've also derived the equation for the relativistic aberration of light. Bear in mind that these derivations still work for non-electromagnetic waves like sound or even water waves. You just need slight modifications to your formulas because the omega to k ratios would no longer be the speed of light, but you can still use similar techniques. It's a bit of a misconception that you can only use classical wave physics for sound and only relativity for light. You can use relativity and wave 4 vectors and Lorentz transformations for any wave as long as you take the different wave speeds into account. In fact, if you use special relativity relativity techniques, you'll actually get a more accurate formula for the Doppler effect of sound than if you were to use classical physics techniques. Anyway, that should do it for this video. I'd like to thank the following patrons for their support, and if you enjoyed the lesson, feel free to like and subscribe. This is the Faculty of Khan, signing out.